Um, what I'm going to do is we're going to kick it off by um, having everybody introduce themselves and talk a little bit about how they're currently farming and what's one thing they do differently in their garden when they're cultivating for resin versus cultivating for flower production. So I'm going to start it off uh, right here with Michael Fang. Michael, you want to give us a brief introduction, where you're farming, how you're farming, and you know, what you do differently cultivating for flower versus resin? Up for Michael. What's up, everybody? So um, I'm Michael Fang, um, M4K. I've gone by a few different names, but uh, Gage Green Group is my company, and uh, you know we we had the Organic Cup and Third Eye Gathering and stuff like that. So. If you guys are looking for genetics, Seed Bank International, legit genetics, that's all us. But um, yeah, I've been growing organically. I've, I've actually grown every method. Um, so, but I am like, not, now I'm strictly organic and it's been this way for like over a decade. Um, basically because I can't assimilate or smoke or breathe non-organic flour or resin for that long before I feel some kind of pain or discomfort, just become real sensitive. So all my food, all my consumption is like 90 plus percent is organic or at least organically sourced, right? Um, just because that's the only way uh, if you're trying to heal and have the best experience. So that's how I grow. Um, I, I've grown with water only, I've done the no-till method, I've done like full nutrient regimen, feed. Um, I love it all. There's basically, depending on what you're trying to go for, what situation, I think. Um, so like, let's just talk about like resin and flour in terms of what I would normally do. Like I think with flour, I tend to push them a little harder because I'm trying to get, a, not really trying to get weight, but I'm trying to get a full expression of the growth of the plant material, essentially. I'm trying to get the buds to swell at the end. I'm trying to get that full calyx development. I'm trying to get those calyxes to close up. I'm trying to get all the pistols to recede. Um, it's A lot of it's like the aesthetic appeal. Um, obviously, with, with resin, you can harvest it a lot earlier. Um, but on that regard, I just had this conversation with my friend when I'm using a lot of benefit, like the proper compost teas, the lactobacillus, the purple bacteria, and everything is sound in the garden, I actually don't see a lot of ambering, <clears throat> if at all, on a lot of my plants. And it's just even like week, you know, final week, the plant is fully developed, it's rock hard, it's um, faded, you know, it's fading, you're not gonna take it any longer, but the resin is still pretty clear. And We've, I've never figured out if that's like good or bad, but I have, I grow OGs that like have a heady effect and um, are uplifting. And so it's like, it's changed the dynamic of how certain flowers respond and then changed my perspective of like how long I can take this flower and et cetera. But anyways, that's just, this is a little gist of what I do. Everything we do is natural and uh, based in nature. And I think that's the way to go. So thanks everyone for being here. Thank you, Michael. Little Lake Valley Seed Co. has been around for probably a lot longer than you guys know. Taylor's been working on resin production um, in this space for a really long time. Um, he's not one to brag or talk about himself, but he's been involved in this and, and pushing this forward for, for a really long time. And I've got a tremendous amount of respect for Taylor and, and what he's done and what he continues to do, not only with his seed line, but with his resin production. He's one of the hardest working guys I know. He's one of the only guys that makes me feel lazy. Um, and yeah, so I'm gonna pass it off to T, but, but shout out Little Lake Valley Seed Co for hooking you guys up with a single pack of seeds here. How you guys all doing? Taylor, Little Lake Valley Seed Co. So I started saying, sorry if my voice gets a little messed up. Did a lot of dabbing, we got off the plane, didn't sleep very much, so voice is a little haggard. Um, so one of our sayings, thank you guys for all coming and purchasing a ticket and supporting Jameson and everybody else that is involved, like Mission Hill Melts, Adam, Hannah, they did such a wonderful job putting this together. 
So thank you guys so much for coming out and participating. It's great. And so like I am the president and CEO of Mendocino Natum Naturals Corporation, and I'm also the owner of Little Lake Valley Seaco and the owner of Black Market Donuts. And so my methodology with growing is producing as much as you can self-sustainably on your property. So all the compost teas I use, I make all my own compost. I produce all my own uh, worm castings on the property and my own worm bins. I have different uh, breeds of worms in different bins because they produce different types of castings and they also live at different le levels in the dirt. So they eat different things. So you can like put, so for instance, like blue African worms live really high up in dirt. So you can put a lot of things in there that are very slow composting, like horsetail, and get a lot of natural silica to be able to put in your compost teas. Then you got like red worms that live really deep. So stuff that's fast composting, you wanna put in there and those types of bins. And uh, so what I do is I take my worm castings and you might've seen the episode uh, on YouTube that we have that I take my worm castings and I spread them around the base of the plant. And I got this off of Kona coffee growers off of the island of Kona in, in uh, Hawaii where they would take just worm castings and spread it around their trees. And I was like fascinated. I was just like, what? Like this is all you do to produce some of the world's best coffee? You just spread worm castings around the tree? So you make a base and they told me, don't spread it too close to the actual base of the tree because it will like burn and affect it. You wanna make like a two foot, a two foot ring around like the base of your plant with the worm castings. And uh, I produce all my own ferments on the property. And you wanna do ferments of stuff that's like around your area. You don't wanna go more than like 10, 15 miles away from where you're like actually cultivating because the native like natural organisms, you want those like to be in your garden. You don't really wanna collect them too far away. And uh, one of the other things for resin that I do that most people don't is I use shade cloth. I come from Northern California, so we come from the land of big, big outdoor grows, big, big depth grows. The sun, it sounds a little weird, every time I say this to people, the sun is very detrimental to your resin production. It's too hot, it's too intense. It literally fries the resin. So you get like a 30% shade cloth. I recommend getting a whitish to grayish color because black absorbs heat, makes your greenhouse is too hot or your field areas, you want a 30% tint on the shade cloth. So you're gonna have like 70% coming through. You guys ever notice when you have a dep in the winter, you do a dep run or you have an indoor run and your, your resin's just completely lighter, you get cleaner resin, all that kind of stuff. That's coming from like the sun. The sun is literally cooking your resin outdoor. Now, if you're going indoor, shade cloth is not like, shade cloth isn't a thing. You just turn down your lights, your ballast, and you're good. But if you're going to grow outdoor, you want to run shade cloth. And it produces like, even for flour, like you guys that are going for flour and have batches that aren't for resin, this makes your flour that light lime green where you don't get that super dark. And then like shade cloth is one of the biggest secrets for people who grow for resin, like in my opinion. Thank you guys. That's fire. That's some fire insight. So I first met Josh Sneedsland five or six years ago when I reached out to him to help me on a site assessment in the Caribbean that I was looking at. And ultimately that project never went anywhere, but Josh had an incredible impact on not, not only the trajectory of, of my career and where I wanted to take things, but my life in general. Um, you know, he turned me on to a book called uh, The One Straw Revolution by Manasobu Fukuoka and really turned me on to dragonfly and regenerative farming and biodynamics and, and all that stuff and, and really sparked that fire. So, um, you know, I've been able to, you know, maintain a really good friendship with him and, and I'm proud to call him a good friend. So, you know, anytime this guy speaks, I listen. Um, so yeah, give it up for Josh Sneedsland. Thanks, Th thanks a lot, buddy. I, I appreciate that. Yeah, so basically what I do, and you're going to find a common theme with the f 
a lot of the folks up here is that um, I specialize in uh, living soil systems that are with a, the main focus on a kind of biologically, uh, the, the fertility is ran by the biology. So biologically driven fertility systems where we literally focus on just the biological fraction, um, not paying a lot of attention to the chemistry, um, really following kind of Dr. Elaine's uh, Ingham's um, methodology of just really, as long as you focus on the biological activity and ma make sure that you've got the right quantities and the right, um, you know, the right types of biology present in your system, you're going to be able to cycle nutrients, you know, the plant will be able to cycle nutrients for itself utilizing that, that kind of minimum input system. And so what I've found in, in the systems that I put together is that the more variables I can eliminate from cultivation systems, the easier they are to establish SOPs for scaling, um, for just reducing, you know, the, the possibility for human error. Uh, so, you know, simple automation systems like, you know, blue mat systems. And, and I know a lot of people, uh, you know, they're kind of a love-hate relationship with that particular watering system. But I think I firmly believe you get it dialed. Uh, that eliminates a huge variable. So, so I really try to eliminate variables everywhere I can. So if you've followed me or, or, or paid attention to any of my work up to this point, you'll know that I don't do any ferments. I don't hate ferments. I think they're uh, extremely valuable and they, they certainly help the garden. I've just found ways to um, explore cultivating by stripping away as much things as, as possible and just letting the natural process kind of uh, take place. And what we found is that there is the myth of reduction in yield, you know, it is, has been disproven time and time again. Um, the myth that you just have to sacrifice quality if you're, you know, using organic methods is, is just kind of once again disproven. And what we found is that when you allow the plant to interact with the soil in the way that it was designed to interact, um, you end up getting the maximum genetic expression of, of that particular cultivar. And so um, we've found side-by-side -side tests with you know, regular nutrient ran lines, and I've ran like Granddaddy Purple forever when it was really popular, ran it in salt systems, turned around and ran it in a living soil system, and the turf profile was entirely different. Same mother plant, same genetics, same environment, um, really just was the difference between soil and like a deep water culture system and the expression was vastly different so you know I think from a hash makers perspective um, exploring those things is really good I think a lot of times with the regenerative or the um, kind of the organic quote-unquote organic community you can really get this kind of a holier than now, or because people are really, really very passionate about how they, how they cultivate their resins, especially when it's organic. And you really don't want to like, it can turn people off, right? It really can. And so I think that, um, you know, having uh, uh, some compassion and understanding for folks who are cultivating it uh, uh, with salts. And um, I know lots of folks who are using salts and are doing really good work. So I'm not one of those folks that's just like, eh, organic or nothing, even though I do would like to introduce the concept to folks to maybe explore. So if you're using salts, maybe explore with a living soil bed. See the differences that you're going to experience with your own, with your own two eyes and your own sensory organs, you know, like not just looking at somebody's pictures on Instagram, not just taking their word for it, but fucking do the work and just check it out and, and see, I, I challenge you, see where you can reduce variables, see where you can reduce things that you're doing in the grow and you're, I guarantee you, you're going to find that the more you learn how to just be an observer, a conscious observer, and when to step away from the garden and let the garden be a garden, you're going to be re rewarded abundantly with that with that practice. So. Appreciate you, Josh. I think we all know who the next man on the mic is and the impact that he's had in our community. I consider him like a grandfather. Like if I have big problems, I'll go to pa Papakaya and tell him about him, and he'll usually have a solution for me. So um, I, I'm really proud to call this dude a friend. And, and one thing about Kai is not only does he have uh, the respect of the community, but he's a successful businessman in, in Washington, you know, with a really successful business. So he's succeeding in a market that the majority of people are failing in right now and, and, and putting up numbers. So I think that 
you know, Kai is again one of those people that, you know, when he talks, we should all listen. And no matter how quiet he speaks, we better lower our, lower our volume to listen. So big shouts out to Kai and big respect, man. Thank you. At least he didn't call me Papa Smurf. <laughs> Um, I'm Ross Kayapal. I'm from the Kitsap Peninsula up in Washington, which is kind of an hour outside of Washington, or uh, Seattle. And um, we have a rec farm that's a tier three, so we can do pretty big cultivation. We do indoor, outdoor. Um, we specialize in solventless hash. And um, I do seeds. I've been breeding for quite a while. And uh, I don't know. Um, <laughs> Um, as far as what, as what far are you as, doing cultivation wise differently when you're producing for resin kaya? <laughs> yeah, so number one thing is we we run different genetics. I mean, the stuff that I'm running for flour really doesn't hash well. Um, it's got secondary terpene type stuff. It smokes great in joints, but it just doesn't hash well. The flavors don't translate well. So I think running the right genetics is is super crucial. Um, I'd say that's like the the top thing. Um, you know good point about aesthetics you know when you're when you're putting out flowers people shop with their eyes in washington's market you can't smell what you're buying even um so you know you might take a little more care for flowers um versus hash stuff you know the structure of it really doesn't matter we're just looking at how good the quality comes back on the wash um we grow basically one way across the farm even even indoors our beds which Guess what? You can grow indoors in beds on scale. Don't let anybody tell you you can't. Um, and, and there's other people doing it like way better than anybody up here. Um, Green Life out in Vegas is like the Steve man. Steve can't well. Yeah, he's it killing it. It's, it's incredible stuff. Um, but, you know, creating those, those so soil profiles and, and growing them in living soil, getting your biology up, as far as when you're washing stuff, those plants have a better cell structure. They stand up better in the wash. You're not going to get green out. Um, you know, besides the terpenes being better, you know, in, in my experience, you know, the plant structure is better, you know. So if you, can, if you can learn to incorporate some of those natural methods, you know, even if you're doing some kind of hydro, so I guess with salts, I don't know how you're going to do that. But, you know, the key is, is that microbial component, you know. And this is really kind of, when, when I figured this out, it blew my mind. Like your stomach and the plant, are very similar in the way that they uptake nutrients. They can do it via a weak acid secretion, right? Or they can do it via microbial exchange. And when you get the microbial exchange, you're getting a higher nutrient content. And that's just, you know, when you think about it on the smallest level, right? That's, and, and you don't have to do a lot, right? Doing less is more, right? So when we set up our, our gardens, we're not in there a lot, you know? The outdoor stuff, we maybe have to water it twice, you know, we put a T on it in the early part, an F-A-A-T. We put a, a bloom T on it, and, and that's about it. You know, it holds water. You're not, you're not out there, and, and that's kind of the point of your garden. It isn't to enslave you. <laughs> you know, the farmer should have time to, to go and meditate and go swimming, you know, and talk to his friends and, and have a life, and then you bring that good energy back to the garden. You know, and if you're in a situation where you're feeling stretched, you know, maybe you're doing too much. You know, Master Cho says you can garden as big as your heart is. So, um, you know, I think having that heart to connection and intention when you're cultivating, um, it comes through on the effects. This is just, it's just factual, you know. That's, that's, that's part of the experience. So if you can incorporate that, that, that mindfulness in the garden like Kelly was talking about earlier, um, you know, you're going to get great results, you know, whether you're doing it for flour or for, uh, for hashish, so... With that, I'll pass it on. Thank you. Give it up for Kyle. <laughs> Kelly, you've been working with the plant for multiple decades and are a pillar in our community since I've come into it and somebody that I look up to and also look for guidance towards. Um, what are some of the things, wh where are you cultivating, how are you cultivating, and what are some of the things that you do differently when cultivating for flower as opposed to resin? <clears throat> Well, I think most importantly, um, definitely the microbial input, which is what Kaya was just talking about here, is really important because the plant has an endophytic system, which is what Kaya was just talking about, which is very similar to our microbiome. 
And when we look at plants that are uh, grown in salts in comparison to the endophytic system of plants that are grown with a full, well-rounded microbial um, soil, we find that there might be several hundred more species in the microbial one than the one that's grown in salt. So, of course, there's going to be a much better ability for the plant to be able to show its full potential. And I think that with hash making, what we're looking for is the plant's absolutely full potential. And I think that when you're growing flower, you can be growing for maybe sexy bag appeal. You could be maybe growing for color. You could be growing for, you know, sexy bag appeal. You could be growing for sexy bag appeal. So what I'm saying is, is that it's a little bit more intentional when we're growing for those crystals. And when we're growing for crystals, we can actually make a comparison of the incredible power of crystalline energy. And that's exactly what it is that we're doing when we're icing this down and those heads are breaking off. We're growing crystals and we're growing millions and billions and billions of crystals that are gonna break off and we want them very pure. So I feel like when we are breeding for hash, that's really important, we want to be breeding for hash and be getting good, you know, plants from people who are doing it regeneratively because we know that we're going to be getting a full endophytic, healthy plant because I'm sure a lot of you all know what it's like to get a plant that sucks. It's really hard. It's hard to put it into like a little hospital area and then you like bring it back to growth. But if we're all on the same path and we all know how to look for pests and we all know how to grow responsibly, then we not only can share information, but we can also share the breeding, which is what we've been doing. So high quality breeding along with really intentional soil systems is really important. And I think that the very most important thing is what Kaya had mentioned, is that we are doing it intentionally. And that every single flower that you put out, every single head that you're putting out as rosin is going to go affect somebody's moment, day, life, their entire experience with cannabis. And right now, it's so powerful, these experiences. How is it that we want to cultivate and put forward that energy? So it's a very energetic responsibility. And I think that that's the most important thing um, in producing heads for hash. Give it up for Kelly. I have not had the pleasure of getting to know Ganja Gill very well. But I do know the respect that he holds from the elders in the community. And it has been, without a question, my search to hunt him down and get him on these panels, and, and I've finally successfully done it. So give it up for Gil. Let's hear from Gil. Kelly's a tough act to follow, but I'm going to do my best. But... Uh... Stoked to be here with everybody. I'm Ganja Gill. Um, everyone knows me as Gill. Uh, Ice Wook is my hash thing. You know, it's not really a brand or a business to me personally. It really is a lifestyle. I love cannabis. Um, it's shaped my path and what I've done with my life and introduced every important person I have um, in my life to me including all these people on the stage and a bunch of people out there. So I'm forever grateful for cannabis and the opportunity it's provided for me and the lifestyle that it's created for me. Um, I started cultivating and making hash on the East Coast, believe it or not. I was raised in Massachusetts and Rhode Island, bounced around New Hampshire, Maine, and Vermont. That's kind of where I got my start. And then fled to California to not be persecuted for growing cannabis. 
Um, <clears throat> it's hard, uh, a lot of the things that people said I agree with, but at the same time, to me, this is gonna sound rude, but growing cannabis is really not that hard, and neither is hash making. It's pretty easy, you know? It's all about environment. I live in California where the environment's really good to grow cannabis, so it's easy. You know, I grow outside, I grow in greenhouses. It's a good spot. And if you're growing indoors, I do that too. If you dial your environment, you know, you have a good indoor environment. Cannabis is intelligent. It's gonna, it's gonna do its thing, you know. I think where a lot of people go wrong is they have a heavy hand, and I've been that person. I've done every, like Mike said, I've grown weed every which way. I've done it all, all the wrong things, a little bit of right things, but um, it's not that hard. It really isn't, you know. Cannabis is smart. If you can get that relationship going between the plant and the soil, and they're communicating with one another, and you kind of just step back, it's gonna do its thing. Um, resin harvesting showed me that. You know, I used to try to do too much, and the resin was affected, as people mentioned, you know, but as soon as I kind of pulled back and really just kind of embraced the soil, stopped tilling it, stopped messing with it, stopped putting too much into it, the resin began to shine, and uh, the proof's in the pudding, you see it happen. So it's really important to kind of just like, in my opinion, let it do its thing. You know, if you're pushing it, you're just gonna bulk the flower, like Mike mentioned, like, uh, that's not what we're really trying to do. You know, as, if you let the resin shine, it will, you know, uh, it just does its thing, you know, that's what cannabis wants to do. That's literally what it's trying to do. It's trying to protect itself. It's gonna resin up like that. The flavors will develop more. Uh, so that's really, to me, the best thing you could do if you're trying to grow for hash. I have friends who are, you know, crop steering like crazy indoors, you know, trying to get that four pounds per four by four area. And like, it makes trash hash for one, but like, that's not really the goal. I'm really trying to grow grams per square foot. And that's the difference, you know, like it's all about surface area. If you can actually not grow huge flowers and actually have the plant do what it's supposed to do and expose that surface, that's where you're gonna get the most resin from. So just another reason, in my opinion, to really not push it too hard, you know, for that simple reason alone. But I'm trying to think of a, yeah, I don't know. Give it up for Gail. <laughs> All right, so where do you guys want to take this? Like, this is, this is for you guys. I see some people taking advantage of the notepads. Does anybody have any questions? Cultivation-related questions for the panel. Let's go high tide. Uh, are you always the topic of resin versus We're going we're to definitely touch on that later, but definitely on a different panel. We want to strictly stick to cultivation-related questions for this panel. We got homie in the back over there. So the question was, what's the best way to harvest plants on scale while protecting the resin? Great question, bro. Let's take this all the way through. So you want to start with Michael here? Michael's been smoking some dabs. Uh, well, I mean, I don't really grow on scale. All right? right. So I might not have the right. But, you know, everything, if you do anything with intention... Like, there's a difference between just cutting a plant down and letting it hit the floor and scraping across other plants... Whereas, like, you could do it to perfection. Like, it can be an art form. And, of course, that's teaching your employees and people who are a part of your team to treat every movement and act and breath and thought as a meditation. That's how I kind of guide my garden, and I think that's how I would do it on scale as well. But someone might have a better... I know you dealt with some scale, T. So... 15 trained workers can take down 10,000 square feet every eight hours. So every, like, so it's, you, you harvest at night. And we're talking again, I'm, I'm in the land of outdoor, I'm in the land of depths. So you don't harvest in the sun, it destroys everything, it's too hot. So you, night shifts, 
eight hour night shifts into the early morning when it stays cool. You get 15 trained workers. At 15 workers, they should be able to take down 10,000 square feet, no problem, every eight hours. And uh, the, yeah, go ahead. So people are buck, like getting huge branches into bins. They're going in to, to the area. Then they're getting bucked down into the certain size. People are instantly bagging them. They go into ice chests with dry ice to flash freeze them. And then they get tossed inside the freezer. Do not, whatever you do when you're cutting fresh frozen, do not stack your freezers full of fresh bags you will create a mini compost pile inside of a freezer because the inside of those bags in the center of that pile will heat up. And you will get like, you'll, you'll open a freezer and the outside bags, you'll be good and you'll get down into the center of the freezer and they'll be like moldy bags. Like that's the important part about flash freezing. Some people will actually layer dry ice in their freezers with their bags as they're going to create like a mini flash freeze. I don't do that. So I don't have the space for that. So I, so much production that we flash freeze inside ice chests and then stack them in the freezers to make sure they're like completely, completely frozen. Yep. Ex exactly. Steensland, I know you know about scale. You did, uh, you hand harvested 100 acres, I think. Is that, is that the right number? Well, not me personally. <laughs> we, did, we did do 100 acres at scale. And, uh, you know, and that wasn't for hash, obviously. <laughs> that was something else. But I think, you know, I, I think at scale, not to, because we're all going to have really similar answers when it comes to handling and freezing. But I think that one, one little thing that I could probably add that, that we would do is um, I, I prefer to do all of the water fan bucking a week before we go to harvest. That way there's not a lot of that lychee chlorophyll. The, the wounds have time to heal from the, uh, from the detachment process. And I just feel that that helps reduce uh, potential contaminants. So we try to get as much of that material stripped off before, like uh, well uh, over a week before harvest. So we, you know, Around, around two weeks before harvest, we're really going in there and hitting them hard. Um, what just, tool do you, like to use for that? Uh, you know, just a good, a good pair of scissors, or you know, I'm not even opposed to a nice, you know, if with the if the product is hydrated properly, you know, that water leaf should really just snap right off. You know, I I, I prefer less kind of evisceration as possible. If we can just kind of snap it and create a nice clean wound, you know, I, but I'm also not fucking obsessing over it you know i'm just trying to get as much of that work done beforehand let those wounds heal and then you know that way when we're processing yeah yeah exactly what we do at our farm and it, it probably cost us a little money in the beginning getting people trained to do it quick enough and we only have maybe eight people at harvest time um but you know just a table with a string line down it and it kind of gets broken down as it goes um, and they're not allowed to cut any leaf, so they've got to cut it at the stem. Um, and then we drop it onto cookie sheets, um, full cookie sheets with uh, parchment lined. And then we line them in, this has got a bad echo on it, sorry. Um, we line the racks, and then we put it in the cold room and let it cool down first, and then it goes into the walk-in freezer. Um, and then it gets flash frozen, and then once it's flash frozen, um, we like to keep it in there for 48 hours. 24 you can get away with, but 48 gets it good and frozen. And then um, they basically use that parchment and, and put them 1,000 grams into the bags, and then they're on the shelves 1,000 grams at a time, and they're tagged up and, um, and ready to wash whenever. Um, so I, I like the cookie sheets. If you've got a walk-in freezer, it's a, it's a great way to do it and, and get a lot of weight on those racks. So. Ellie, what about you? Um, I think that when we're talking about plants at all and we're talking about medicine, we're talking about set and setting, and that's really what everybody is talking about here. So when we're harvesting the plant, uh, we're really talking about set and setting and how we're going to be treating that plant. What is it that you want? A lot of people do do dry hash making, air drying, and some of the best hash that I've seen in the industry right now has been, you know, air dried hash. 
and rosin. Um, so there's lots of different ways that you can do it, but I think that it's really important to be intentional and think about it before. Because if you're going to be harvesting 500 pounds, then you got to know how you're going to be drying it. you got to know how you're going to be freezing it because one of the biggest downfalls that Oregon, California, and Colorado, and Washington had was harvesting. It wasn't growing the plants, it was harvesting the plants. So I think that, you know, in harvesting, the most important information that I have for everybody or advice that I have for everybody is to make sure that your drying facility, your freezing facility, the people that you've hired are capable to handle what it is that you grew. That's number one. And um, yeah, and whatever it is that you've decided whether you're gonna do it drying or you're gonna be doing it, you know, frozen right off of the, the stock. Just really think about every process and all the way through because each one of those crystals are clear and clean and you wanna make sure that there's no dust, residue, you know, residue of bad energy too. Make sure that all your workers are just stoked to be there. And if anybody's not stoked, then take the day off. Because this is like awesome. This is like the day that we've all been waiting for for the whole freaking year. And maybe some of us who are breeders have been waiting five years for it. So it's a day of celebration. And that's really cool to think about that and celebrating the crystals as they're coming off. Also, I like to uh, harvest early in the morning. And uh, I guess early in the morning means, you know, before the birds go, because, you know, when you're doing it to scale and you've got a lot of plants that you've got to take down all at once, you're starting in the dark. And then um, as the sun hits, you know, you're done for the day. That's about it. Gil, what about you? I think the biggest problem with uh, harvesting on scale is you're growing weed on scale. Everyone's growing, like, way too much fucking weed these days, like, genuinely. Like, even now, New York, it's like, you guys are all growing weed. California is trying to sell all our weed there, dude. Like, come on, you guys are growing way too much fucking weed. But, but, but seriously, I've grown weed on scale, and it sucks. It takes all the love out of it. You know, we're all different. I'm just not that ambitious, you know, so teach their own. But uh, it's this weird thing that I don't know what else it could be but I've given the same genetics to my friends who grow acres and then done it at my place, and the difference is ridiculous. And again, I can't even say what it would be other than just the fact that they're cultivating on scale. That's like the biggest problem. But when it comes to harvesting, it's, it's kind of straightforward. You're trying to get it in the freezer as quick as you can. You know, I do fresh frozen. I don't personally dry material to each their own, but that's not really what I'm doing. Um, but you're trying to get in the freezer as quick as possible. And the more you have, the more workers you have, and the more complicated everything gets. And then it's really this dance where I've seen 100 people chopping fresh frozen at one time. And it's cool, you know what I mean? There's a way to do it, and some people are really successful at it. But uh, a lot of things come at that scale. You know, I would start doing smaller bag amounts like Kaya mentioned 1,000 grams, that's what I do. But like, if you're doing it on that scale, I think you should do 500 grams. Um, something that I thought about is I like to keep my bags open. Don't vacuum seal them. It's like the worst idea ever. I see people do it and they do it lightly and they're like, no, it's fine. I just, I'm not recommending it. But I like to keep my bags open overnight. I feel like uh, I just use freezers. I don't have a walk-in or anything, but I use chest freezers, and the moisture will wick up out of the bags and get stuck to the walls. And I think 100%, way less. And especially like not this past year, but last year we were like harvesting in like the fucking rain. Oregon and California went to shit early, and it was kind of this funny dynamic where like you know, people sell it by the, the weight, you understand? So if there's water on there, it's fucking heavier and you're not gonna get the same yield. And it was really difficult last year when we were brokering stuff because people are buying it and it's like, these are very small pounds, like, and they're not, you're not hitting the yields you need, you know what I mean? Stuff that you were get 5% on, you're getting two or three and it started to complicate it where there still really isn't like a solution to that in our industry right now where it's like, if you're literally buying fresh frozen by the pound and it's fucking raining outside, like, I don't know, it's tough. But uh, it's to me beneficial to leave your bags open overnight, next day tie them up, uh, it's kind of a dance, but 
I feel like I've seen people do crazy shit, like pools of dry ice, and they're like laying plants on it, trying to like get them cold before they go in. It's like gets crazy. Where I just yes, literally the whole plant. Like literally just laying it on kiddie pools of dry ice to like get it cold, you know what I mean? And like the person thought it was the tech. They were like, "Look at my shit, dude!" Like you know, like so I've seen some crazy shit, you know. I, it was baffling to me, dude. You know, like I'm like, "You worried about the heads at all, dude? Like at all? Like all right, get it, get it, yeah." So you just want to do it cool, like ideally, and just for your workers' sake. Try to have like a cool environment, you know. It sucks when it's like 110 in California and you're all like under some shade cloth or in some tent trying to harvest fresh frozen. Like, I've done it. Trust me, I've done it. And like, I was always shocked that often the yields weren't as bad as I thought they were. But I've also seen it go the other way, where it was like, oh, we fucked this up by doing that, you know. So, I think a cool environment is really important. If you can do it inside and like the AC, like. And again, I can do that because my thing's so small. So like, my friends love working for me because it's like inside, it's air conditioned, it's great, you know. So it, that's important. Light obviously matters, like Kelly mentioned. You know, if you want to get like super heady about it, do it under the full moon. You know, it's kind of hard to do that again on scale, but if you can pull that off, I've seen some cool shit happen. You know, uh, that's the cool thing about growing outside that you can't really achieve indoors is. You know, the all that stuff comes into play. You know, the weather, um, the moon, all that stuff. So it's like people talk about harvest windows, like, oh, don't pull early, don't pull late. To me, it's not really about that. It's about trying to capture that expression at that moment. You know. Another question. We got one in the back. You're gonna have to be loud, Alana. question was about crop cover uh, for you guys growing outside. Um, we'll start with Gil. I know you're doing some outdoor. All right, all right, all right. I was going to let Kelly do this. This is like her specialty, I feel like. But um, I used to plant cover crops. And then if you don't really like till your beds, native stuff will kind of repopulate itself. So like what I have in my area is like dichondra and chickweed grow like crazy. And I really like those because they're super low lying. You don't really have to till them. I've planted like buckwheat and rye grass and aphids love the rye grass. Buckwheat goes too tall, like uh, a lot of stuff. I feel like you're constantly mashing it down, but that chickweed and that dichondra really like creep really low and then it's in my area. So it kind of just will naturally reseed itself every year. So I don't really have to deal with it. But again, I'm in California, where we have like very minimal frost. Obviously, if you live in Canada, it's not the same thing. But um, we talk a lot about cover crops, um, so you can check out. Uh, so many of us here do a lot of cover crop talks, so I would check it out. But one thing, one that I really like is Sudanese sorghum grass, uh, because it uptakes like 50 some odd varieties of um, endo uh, mycorrhizas. So if you always have different cover crops, then when you're rotating your crops of cannabis, then the endo mycorrhiza and the fungi is just waiting there and it's attached to other root zones. So the other thing I think with cover crops is if you are living in a really damp, wet environment, uh, probably a little bit of time before you're going to be harvesting it's nice to sort of clear that out and do some pull and drop uh, a lot of people do you know cutting and dropping but I like to pull and drop because it really aerates the soil in the middle of summertime but just sort of getting away some of that green stuff just underneath the plant right before harvest if you're working in outdoor Definitely don't have to worry about it if you're in a dry location. You want to keep it as green as possible because that's just going to be keeping your microbiology in the soil, um, you know, vital. I'd like to add something. Yeah, I think what I would add to that is if you're cultivating in uh, living soil systems or specifically a biologically driven fertility system, I, I always recommend diversity in that companion plant or cover crop scheme. If you're just using one thing or... Uh, you know, kind of monocropping your your companion plant or your cover crops, 
you're missing a unique opportunity to inject uh, a, a wide variety or a diversity of each one of those different plants root exudates and those root exudates will enrich the whole uh, soil matrix you know and so if you kind of just have one plant in the system it's going to enrich the system but you're not going to enrich it with the kind of diversity that mimics the natural environment um, so I would just say shoot for that. And, and even if you're not in, you know, like using a biologically driven fertility system, use that same, you know, a polyculture style uh, a cover crop or companion planting scheme to just enrich all of your property. So like any place you're trying to build soil or trying to, um, you know, maintain proper soil health, diversity is key. You'll see the things that take in your system, the things that don't and you just go with it. And then I think that's where you're gonna get kind of the most bang for your buck when practicing that. And one more thing to add with the diversity is that when you have diversity, then the flowering of those plants are gonna be forming different size pollen. And you wanna be drawing all different types of pollinators. So when there's different size pollens, you're gonna be drawing different size pollinators. So you want to think about, you know, as below is what is as, as above. So diversity is key. I like to use purslane, and it grows on our farm. Um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with purslane. It's kind of like a girdling thing, and um, I believe it's edible, but they make a lot of facial products that women use. It's good for your skin. Um, but, you know, when you're watering, it just breaks the water up really good. And, and uh, I like that. We grow tobacco. Um, in my medical garden, I, I grow poppies. It's just pretty, and uh, I think they kind of all go together. It's a vibe, so. <laughs> T, you want to jump in? So I cover crop during the winter. I use three types of clover, crimson clover, Dutch clover, and white clover. Then I also use soybeans and alfalfa. And what I do is I let those grow all the winter, and the clover is one of nature's best for asphyxiating nitrogen out of the atmosphere. So it'll take it out of the atmosphere and put it into your soil. So after I get that done during the winter and springtime's about coming, let's say three weeks before I plant, I don't do a chop and drop. I don't do a pull and drop or anything because I have literally hundreds of thousands of worms in my beds. What I do is I take a layer of ri rice straw and I smother those plants. Like I put like a huge layer on it it naturally wilts and dies. The worms come up from the bottom of the bed, till all of that green foliage, and then secrete nitrogen-rich worm castings at the top layer. So when you go to plant and you're watering, you don't have to add any nitrogen for like a month. If you do, you'll get nitrogen hook curl on the leaves. So I like utilize the natural process of the worm so I don't have to like do anything. I just literally throw out the seeds that I talked about. They grow. Once it gets time, I smother it. The worms come up, naturally aerate the soil and till it for me. And all I do is plant. Michael, what about yourself? Um, I, I really like the idea of using just the indigenous plants in your area, just because I've planted cover crops and like the clover that I planted was the only one infested with disease or whatever, drawing butt pests, and it's like, it's just not meant for this area. Um, so, yeah, the indigenous plants, especially in Michigan, like, I've never seen um, herbs or any kind of green matter grow so quickly. Like, it'll go from, like, dead of winter to the middle of spring, and plants will be, like, this high in a week, and then you can chop it, and it'll be this high again in a week. Like, I've never seen that in any other place I've lived. Um, but yeah, there's just so much, it's all made for the environment, all the nutrition, the microorganisms, and uh, it's adapted to your region, just like the indigenous microorganisms. So I think it really, that really makes a lot of sense. And um, yeah, we have every herb in our yard. We've never, you know, obviously sprayed any chemicals. It's like a tropical paradise, super lush. We have every um, adapt, like, you know, potent herb from, lamb's quarters to um, I'm like blanking plantains to horsetail to um, clovers to whatever everything is there and so I don't really see the even the need to plant anything if I could just add um, in our gardens we use worm towers so 
basically in, in the beds, I think each bed is maybe 10 feet, 12 feet. And then in each bed, we'll have maybe two, um, basically like a PVC pipe. Um, and then you can, if you're, if you're pulling off your leaf or you've got stuff to compost, you can put it in there, put a lid on it, right? And then the worms can get to it, but you're not going to have issues with gnats so much or different kind of pest pressures that might come from having that, you know, especially in an indoor situation. Um, so that's kind of a, a cool little deal you could try to. We got time for a couple more questions. We got one from MTS Farms in the back. So we, we use um, predatory mites, and we're basically applying them, like, on the regular. Um, and in the soil, like, we're using nematodes, um, rove beetles, which are awesome. Their little larvae will get in there and eat everybody else's eggs, so, and they're very hardy. Um, I've turned them loose on gnat infestations and, like, literally saw, like, a war going on, and they just wiped them out in a matter of days. Um, but, you know, if, if you're staying up on top of it, you're generally not going to get uh, a pressure to the point where, you, you, you know, it's, it's affecting your, your yield or, or causing, like, a major issue. So. Yeah, I'll add to that. Yeah, I, I'm going to double up on that. What, what we do in commercial settings, especially in living soil systems, is we just flood that system with beneficial biology. I mean, a ridiculous fucking amount. Like, wh whatever, the, whatever the recommendations, whoever you're, the insectary, we like six times it. And just to make sure that, that, you know, we're accounting for, you know, it, whatever dies in shipping or, you know, sometimes you just get a less than active batch. We just want to make sure that when we're, where we're pulling the trigger to apply those beneficials, we're applying beneficials. And that, that whatever is in the system or makes it in the system doesn't stand a snowball's chance in hell. Um, and so, once again, diversity is kind of the key with that. We don't just get one type. We get the Stratio S. We get the Swirskis. You know, everything. We just throw literally a biology bomb at the systems. And when you do that, and if you've got your environmental conditions and your hydration down properly, then you know, lots of times those, those insect populations will just kind of stay in the system. So you, you could get away with only having to re-up re you know, once, uh, once or twice a year. Um, we do move into, we, you know, we do like to do foliar applications of simple you know, essential oil type, uh, type preventative sprays. That, help, that helps a lot in early veg. When we move into flower, we definitely switch to some kind of satchel type slow release just so we can maintain proper canopy coverage when, when that happens. You know, and lastly, I would say that, you know, from my direct experience and from work like uh, from Dr. Tom Dykstra, you know, when you have a plant that's running optimally and is in optimal health, just like a human or any other creature that's that's running healthy and optimally, you're going to have systems kind of baked into your hardware that'll allow you to fight off disease and pests. And, we, and that's simply the case with plants as well. So, you well, know, do you want to go into that, Josh, a little bit with bricks and take take yeah, us? Yeah, it's a Let's slippery it. slope. Let's go. It, yeah, it's a slippery slope. But I think that you know, there's a it's kind of a hot topic amongst cultivators. You know, that when you get into BRICS levels and measuring BRICS, which is basically just a measure of complex carbohydrate in your, in your plant tissue, uh, and, and that somehow correlating to um, how efficiently your plant is photosynthesizing. And so if your plant is photosynthesizing properly, has access to all the trace minerals and nutrients, it's going to be, com be creating those complex carbohydrates in the system, um, which create thick cell walls, strong cell structure, um, when the plant is devoid or, nut or nutrient imbalanced or deficient, it's going to create like a simple single chain carbohydrate, which creates weak cell walls, fluid then leaks from the cells, the plant ferments, and uh, a lot of the insects are tuned into that fermentation. So there's another uh, really good book by uh, Andrew Callahan, I believe. It's called Tuning Into Nature. He, it's a deep fucking dive. It's, it's kind of a dry read. But if you're into kind of what's going on with insects, they really dive down into the insect antennae and how they're actually visualizing um, plants that, they're, that, that, that they want to eat. And, and so people like Tom Dykstra, um, John Kemp have done work where, you know, really, uh, uh, 
for a long time we had this kind of hate-hate relationship with, with all of these what we consider destructive insects, but what they're finding is, is that they're really just nature's garbage collectors. They're there to consume the plants that, that higher order creatures aren't fit to consume. So if you've got a field, a crop that's deficient in trace minerals, and you're eating those constantly over time, and your family is eating that for generations, you're eventually gonna be deficient in that, whatever that nutrient is. So there's a biological um, service that's being done by these insects. So if, if you have, and so it was like, like somebody like John Kemp or, or Dr. Arden Anderson would say, which really hurts a lot of feelings and ruffles, ruffles feathers, but if you have insects on your plants, predatory insects, mites, uh, it's because it's garbage. <laughs> and the plants are trying to consume that and get it out of the system because it's not safe for higher order creatures to consume. So without going really too far into that rabbit hole, I'd say look up Dr. Tom Dykstra. He's got a lot of YouTube information available directly related to bricks and plant health. And then you know, look up John, John Kemp's work with uh, advancing ecological agriculture. A lot of really, really good information and deep rabbit hole to go down in relation to bricks and, and plant health as it relates to insect and pathogen resistance. So. Anyone, anyone on the panel? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead, go. What a work. Sorry, brother. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Yeah. Uh, I had the luxury of working with Steve Cantwell at Green Life Productions a few different times, and he really is water only. I've, like, searched the whole place looking for nutrients and pesticides. I've never seen anything there. Like, he is really about that life. And he never sprays, really. And I wondered, like, how do you have, like, 30-cycle beds that you you know, haven't really flipped the dirt out of. And I don't think it's a secret. I'm pretty sure he's posted it, but uh, he uses a blowtorch. He literally walks around with a propane tank and a torch, obviously probably not with plants in there, maybe to like treat a hot spot or something like that, but predominantly in between runs. Um, and again, it's kind of like a scorch the earth mentality, like last case scenario. But if you got a hot spot in your beds, it's like hit it with the blowtorch, you know, you can definitely do it. He's you got ever, like he's got like burn marks on all his beds and like I, I think that's cool that's cool I think I saw him like he'd he'd pot those plants and call them trap plants and then he'd take them just outside his facility and he'd blow torch them outside the rooms I think I saw that in interview totally agree but like <laughs> I've walked the rooms I've seen the burn marks on the beds like I've seen him do it like he, he's doing it you know what I mean it's real it's part of his regimen for sure you know like for sure and like I know grassroots was developing beds for him and he wanted them to be flame retardant but they like couldn't make it happen you know not in like an eco without way toxic. yeah without toxic stuff so but uh he's doing it dude he really is and that burn tech is just for like the very top tiny centimeter. And the reason why he's also doing that is because they don't allow him to lop and drop in Nevada. So he's sort of like, oh, well, if they're allowing me to grow it, then I'll just burn the top. And it really is great for pest management for indoor use. Awesome. Anyone want to jump in on it? Yeah, go ahead, T. Uh, what is that water? Is it Keegan water? Kagan water? Kangan. Kangan. That water. So my, my, I have a really, really hippie ass cousin back home. And like, he's just all about that water. Like any, you go to his house, he wants you to brush your teeth with it. Right. So we need to do some IPM and he's like, let's use the Kagan water. So we started doing our like IPM solutions in that bro. No bullshit. You can almost spray that on a plant by itself and it'll take away PM. It's the craziest shit I've ever, ever seen in my life. We started spraying that and it was like, we went over to a friend's house that had an infestation. We sprayed it once. We went back a week later, and, like, three-quarters of all the shit was dead. Like, all the mites, everything had just died, the PM. And he, like, we came back, and he's like, did you bring any more of that stuff? Like, so it's that. Yeah, but that water, you can use it by yourself, but if you make your IPM solution with that, it's, it's like the holy Krishna. No joke. <laughs> I'd like to add, like, when you're taking clones... Um, right w w when we're washing hash it's mechanical removal so you can mechanically remove bugs just dipping your clones in water 
you know, cold water when you cut them. Give them some dip, dip, and you're going to knock off. If there's some bugs on there, you'll knock them off. So that's a great, um, you know, just using water. You don't need anything special. That, that mechanical action will knock off most bugs, and then you're not really having an issue later on. So, Last question for the panel. There you go, right in the front. I, I think you guys are uh, far enough north up here that I don't, do you guys, have you, you've been to California? Do you guys get the intensity of the sun like we do in Northern California? You don't need them. I, I wouldn't. You don't need them in yeah, up I, here. I wouldn't, I wouldn't no. think you would need a shade cloth up here. Yeah? There, there you go. I, this is my first time okay. in this area, so I'm not familiar with your guys' seasons or anything like that. We, we don't use shade cloths, but in Hawaii, um, I got some family out there, and a lot of them, they do not grow in direct sun. Um, they're growing in, the, in spots under trees, and when they grow like the fancy tea leaves for the lays, for the hula girls, that's all shaded as well. Um, you know, the sun in Hawaii is super intense. I think it really just depends on where you're at, yeah. you know, and it might even also depend on the cultivars you're running, you know, and what you're doing, so... Yeah, like that earlier, that earlier harvest, like that July harvest. Yeah, for sure, definitely. Shade cloth is beneficial for that. The fall one, no, absolutely not. You're totally right, Jonah. I do not put shade on that. I feel like the plants, light depth's just different. You know, like a lot of things, a lot of cannabis genetics, in my opinion, they don't like that trigger. They don't like that harsh flip. In my experience, um, it's not like the best thing for growing cannabis or. Um, resin at all so I feel like anything you can do to kind of coddle it shade cloth yeah it helps with the depth but that second round like I used to go back and forth where I would like force 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 and over the years now I like to make my last one just flip naturally and it always does much better because I feel like again cannabis is intelligent and it's being weaned off it by mother nature so you don't really need to do that for it in my experience For sure, for sure. Yeah, that tan color, white even, you know, for sure. Way better than black or even that green stuff, in my opinion. But as far as, like, a percentage goes, I'm not going to say how much you need. I don't know where you all grow, but, like, a par meter is a cool tool. It's just one tool to have in your shed. You can, like, look at it, measure it. You know, you can really Google intensity pretty easily, what, what you want, and definitely know that that's probably the best way to do it rather than like set a standard for everyone across the country type thing, you know, or globally, you know, I don't know. That's my opinion. Guys, give it up for the first panel of the conference. A lot of guys are going to be back tomorrow on the panel, the same, uh, not the same panel, but a breeding and selecting for resin panel. So a lot of this, uh, I think everybody's going to be coming back up on stage tomorrow. So... If you had any questions you missed, we're going to be able to get them in. Um, we're going to take a five-minute break. Coming up next is the Solventless Workflow and Technology or Terminology panel. We're going to have uh, El Hasho. We're going to have Adam from Mission Hill Melts. We're going to have Lindsay from Gorilla Solventless. We're going to have Spencer uh, from North Sound Solventless, as well as Rackhams. So we're super stoked about that. Give us five minutes. Take some dabs. We'll be right back.